Hello and welcome to the Women's Football Show that we'll be bringing you every month reviewing how the women's team have been getting on. And I'll be joined shortly by Siobhan Chamberlain, but first, here's what's coming up. Aoife Mannion updates us on her recovery. We speak to Head of Physiotherapy for the women's team, Ibrahim Karem. Maria torres Dottier chats to us about her degree. Nikita Paris discusses the importance of Black History Month. And we get the lowdown on Hayley Ladd. Yes, all that to look forward to, but first is joining me, former United goalkeeper Siobhan Chamberlain. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. Well, great to have you here. But let's get straight into the action and see how the women's team got on in the WSL. A delicious cross whipped in from the right-hand side, brilliantly guided into the bottom right-hand corner by Ella Toons, put United a goal to the good. A fantastic ball from Lucy Staniforth set Leah Galton on her way, who unselfishly cut it back to Toon to make it 2-0. As we approached half-time, United made it three. And this time it was Ella Toon who returned the favour for Leah Galton, who made no mistake of finding the back of the net. The French legs of Adriana and Leon helped her latch onto the ball and smash home her first goal in a United shirt. Katie Zellum's delightful cross from a free kick found the head of Nikita Paris just outside the six-yard box to put United ahead and for Nikita Paris to score her first WSL goal. Leah Galton heading away the corner delivery which fell to Josie Green who volleyed from outside of the area, forcing a brilliant save out of Mary Earps. the cross for Golton, teeing up Paris, and that's 1-0 for Manchester United. Nikita Paris with back-to-back -back goals for her new club. Bit of space here though for Leah Golton. Lovely feet, Golton still going! Lovely goal! Garcia, chance, and the third goal, Hayley Ladd, guides Manchester United into a commanding lead here. Yes, it's been a great WSL campaign this month. Now, Siobhan, what have you made of it? It's been brilliant, hasn't it? I don't think you could have written the scripts any better if you'd have tried. You're scoring goals, keeping clean sheets. Got to mention the clean sheets because that's the most <laughs> important part as a former goalkeeper. But good performances, like you couldn't have asked for more from the players, rotating the squad, giving different players opportunities. And I think that's one of the, the key things at the moment that you'll need throughout a long season is squad depth. And I think the, the recruitment over the summer has provided that and it is, it's given an opportunity for others to come in and, and do well when they're given that opportunity, but also push those that maybe expect to start every game. And now manager Mark Skinner, he's been continuously telling us that, you know, clean sheets, they win titles. And I'm presuming you know that very well. Yeah, definitely. I think you can score goals, but if you're conceding goals at the same time, it makes things difficult. If you can have a strong base, build from a strong defensive structure and keep clean sheets, then you've only got to potentially grab the odd goal every now and then to be able to win yourself games. But United at the moment have been scoring bags of goals, so that's not an issue. But keeping clean sheets is vital, especially when you go into this tough run of games that they've got coming up, starting with Chelsea. Yeah, it'll be great to see what happens. But all the players have been grafting, especially Aoife Mannion. We've seen last month that she's been working hard on her recovery, so let's get updates from her. Do you think that this experience has made you stronger? 
Yes, uh, there's, no other, there's no other choice. That's another thing about football injuries as a professional sports player is that you have to get through them. You don't have an option just to say, OK, um, maybe I'll just, you know, do a less intensive form of exercise. There's no other choice than to return to the level um, of the sport that you were at. That's quite unique. Most people, you know, in the world that will have um, ACL injuries probably won't be actual professional players. Um, and so, yeah, it definitely in terms of um, that kind of strength of character more than probably physical strength, uh, having sort of a long-term injury definitely cultivates that. Can you talk us through the journey that you've taken with the injuries and also the key elements that have got you to today? So I did my first ACL injury back in 2019. It was quite a dramatic contact moment and so it was really, really unusual and actually I did, I did my ACL but I also did a lot of collateral damage around that um, and from the day that I got injured until I returned it was about 15 months so it was a really really long time it was really drawn out we had the Covid experience um, which was obviously really unsettling for everybody um, and, and what that meant in the football world was obviously we weren't in the training ground so a large portion of my rehab was at, at, um, at, at home um, you know the, the rehab was was long it was very very draining um, I think I didn't get the rub of the green in the way that potentially I, I've had it this time um, and so I felt very weathered by the time that I got back this time however it seems to be going really well I'm feeling energized I'm feeling competitive I'm getting itchy feet I'm asking the physio how long how long and so it's just kind of almost two different injuries even though they're both called ACLs and I'm happy that it, you know, this time feels like the good, the good or the better experience of the two rather than last time. So yeah, it's been a long process, but there's been lots of things going on in them in terms of, you know, the, the individual experiences. And I'm really, really excited to sort of be nearing the end. I can kind of see the light at the end of the tunnel at the moment um, and hopefully be able to close the door on it at some point. So now joining me is Head of Physiotherapy for the women's team, Ibrahim Karem. How are you? Good, thank you. How are you? I'm all right, thank you. Now, thanks for joining us. We're in the gym for the women's team. Now, talk to me about what it's been like this season. Have you been enjoying it so far? Yeah, it's been incredible. I think since I've arrived, um, yeah, it's been a really, really cool, cool journey so far. Where we are now as a team, I think, is a great place in terms of how we all link up with um, like coaches and medical and performance and media and analysis. So. Um, yeah, couldn't ask for more in terms of the, the, the team. And now you have been working hard. We've got Millie Turner back on the pitch, but we've also got Aoife Mannion going through the rehabilitation process. What's it been like for you? Yeah, it's been incredible with both those athletes. I think Millie was um, a joy to work with. Um, great fun, really hard worker, professional, motivated. And I think Aoife is exactly the same. She's um, yeah, really motivated, driven, um, asks great questions, does the extras. Doesn't need to be pushed at all. She sort of like motivates herself really. So um, yeah, both athletes have been class to, to work with. And what has been the ACL injury like? What's it been like kind of getting them back on the pitch? Because it's a longer process, isn't it? Yeah, I think we try to, to break it down into mini goals. So when you think of nine to 12 months, it sounds like a long time, but I think when you break it down into our six phases of ACL rehab we have at this club, we've got yeah, phase zero to phase six. Each of those phases has objective criteria to progress and tests and clinical markers of, of progress. So the athlete can see they've got to tick that box and that box and that box. So it doesn't seem like they're just waiting for time to pass. They've got to actually work hard to achieve, um, achieve the box tick or the exit criteria. So I think when you break it down, it's, it's easy. When you think of a big picture, it can be daunting for an athlete, but we frame it um, that way. We frame it in terms of a performance here. We're trying to get them coming back better, faster, stronger, ideally fitter. Um, not always the case, sometimes they, they don't always achieve that, but that's always the goal and we try to make sure they come back as well as they can do. And I guess people don't realise how much more effort has to go into women's football than the men's because they're a lot more at risk at ACL injuries with wider hips and things and you've got to put that into account. Yeah, I think there's a few factors. Obviously, um, sometimes the, the staffing is different to men's staffing. Obviously, you, you work with a, a lesser resourced budget sometimes. You, you're stretched to have a breadth of expertise rather than a sort of a, a specialism. But I think that that's obviously got its, its joys as well. Having um, inputs into a lot of different areas is quite a, a fun thing to be involved with. Um, and with females specifically, yeah, you're right. I think obviously predisposition with wider hips um, and factors like proprioceptive factors and, and motor control and things we've found just being in the environment for a year with regards to core control and core strength. 
um, is definitely something we're aware of and we're trying to address for sure. And then as well as the physical demands and wanting to look after that, but mentally you've got to look after players too and make sure they're with it because you've got to make sure they give the rehab programme the absolute best they can possibly give, but 100%. to get back on the pitch too. Yeah, 100%. I think the mental side's the biggest side and it's probably the, the least looked into or the least appreciated, but if you haven't got somebody's headspace or they're demotivated or stressed or they're not clear about the plan um, or they don't trust you is a big one, I think it's hard to get the results that you, you look for. So. Yeah, the mental side, we try to work on really well, I think, in, in, at Man United, and we make sure the athlete um, is the centre of our focus. Every choice we make is based on their well-being and their welfare, and um, we include them in the process. And we have the original ACL meeting with Aoife and, and with Millie. We show them the plan, we get their input, we get all their questions answered, and as we go through, we make sure it's an open dialogue with how they feel. And um, yeah, it's a two-way street, definitely. And now I know that all of us and the fans can't wait to see Aoife back on the pitch as well, because we were so excited when we see Millie. So. We'll be hoping to see her soon. How far is her progression? <clears throat> yeah, so she's in um, the end of her phase four, we call it. So she started um, her perturbation, which is sort of contact and being pushed, um, 1v1s, tackling. So we're trying to get her confident and um, ticking all those criteria on the pitch together. Um, we have another sort of four weeks of our last phase with E for a nine isolation. Then she goes into training with sort of modifications. She was outside of drills to begin with and then on the inside of drills and then she starts doing the games. So we're hoping to get some, um, some under 23s matches over December. Fingers crossed, pending everything goes re really well between now and then. And then we're aiming for sort of end of January to make her WSL um, first game again. Well, we will keep everything across for that. Well, thank you very much for joining me. We can't wait to see it. But now we've seen all the league action, but let's take a look at how the girls have got on in the Continental Cup. As Manchester United burst forward now from midfield. Paris is providing the option. Here she is now, Nikita oh. Paris, wonderful finish. That is an absolutely terrific goal. And it's her first in a Manchester United shirt. Exactly what she needed and exactly what Manchester United needed. Flicked on dangerously that. Away. Oh, what a fabulous strike. What a fantastic strike. Struck it first time, and nothing the keeper could do about that. All over the top. Thomas was close. What a fantastic strike. That came from absolutely nowhere. Unbelievable goal. Yeah, so our Conti Cup campaign there for this month now hasn't been the best of results, but do you think there's some positives to take from it? You've always got to take positives from something. I think there's not as many as you'd want to get from the Conti Cup at the moment, but there's still time. And I think it's important that you can rotate your squad and give players minutes, but they've got a point to prove as well. They want to go out there and, and put on good performances and, and get the wins. Um, the Durham result probably more frustrating than, than the Villa result. And yeah, it's a tough place to go. But with the quality that, that we've got, it should have been enough to, to get the result over the line. So that there's there's things that they'll go away and they'll review, I'm sure, looking at analysing um, as a as a former player. If you lose a game, that you sh especially if you shouldn't have lost it, you'll go away and you'll beat yourself up about it. You'll keep watching, you'll keep reviewing, you'll be looking for what you can do better, how you can improve. And that's, that's the biggest thing, learning from it. I guess if you're making some mistakes, you'd rather have it, especially with how strong our league campaign's going at the minute, you'd rather have it in the Conti Cup, would you say? You would, but I think for those players that have potentially been given that opportunity in the Conti Cup, that's not where they want to, they don't want to be making any mistakes. But it's tough when, when you're not playing as many games regularly to kind of try and find your flow. But yes, you want to be keeping that pristine record in the, in the WSL. So yes, Conti Cup is definitely a preference right now. Now, we have been speaking to Maria Torres-Dartier about what she's been up to off the pitch. So Maria, how are you doing? Yeah, I'm good, thank you. Well, that's good to hear. Now, we're having a, a bit of a wander in Carrington, but we want to find out a little bit more about you. But first of all, congratulations. You've just graduated MBA. Talk to us about it. Well, thank you. Um, yeah, no, I'm just so, um, so happy and, and proud. Uh, it's such a big achievement for me and just feel 100 kilo lighter now um, to like have submitted it and been graduated. So it's nice. 
it's funny that you mentioned weight off your shoulders because we just spoke to Mark before and he said you bet you feel like you got weight off your shoulders. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, it is. Uh, it's been tough. Um, the last three months have been really tough with Euros, the Master, um, coming back in pre-season. So it's been a lot for me. So um, I'm glad it's done. Now the fans, they've been curious what course it is, why you chose it. Can you tell <laughs> us about it? Um, so it's uh, a Master in Business Administration. To be honest, I would never choose it if I, if, if I don't know how to explain it. But when I was in Chelsea, we got this opportunity. So I jumped on it and thought, why not? Um, and here I am, and I'm so grateful. And now me and you were having a chat in Toulouse when you were doing your interviews for it. Yeah. You're talking about media too in sports, and it's quite kind of nice trying to still connect it to on the pitch things that are going on. Oh yeah, definitely I can. So. Uh, it is really helpful and also like looking forward um, would be interesting to to work in, in an environment like this. It is. And now, how have you been finding the season so far? Yeah, good. It's been a it's been a great start and uh, hopefully it continues. So, with this degree, what are you going to do with it now? Oh, it's a really good question. <laughs> I mean, the day I finish football, it is really good to have a backup plan. So, uh, we'll see what I will end up with. But at least I've got a degree and. Uh, yeah, that's, I've got a backup plan. And I don't think it gets spoken enough about, really. We always hear about, you know, academy footballers, here's your plan B, you know, if football isn't your thing. But for those players that have been playing senior football, like week in, week out, what do they do when they are finished with it? And it's nice to know that you're already getting yourself prepared. You're well ahead of the game. Yeah, no, I know. Um, it is, I think it's really important and also like showing young kids that it is, you can do both. You can graduate, you can play football. It is tough and challenging, but it's so worth it in the end. Like you never know with football, with injuries and whenever you finish it, like it is good to have something to go back to. It's really nice to hear how important education is to you, especially manager Mark. He was a teacher and he, yeah. education is really important. So what's been his take on it as you've been doing this on the side? <laughs> no, he, they've been supportive and they obviously know how hard it is. and. It is challenging, like your head is full of, you have to perform on the pitch, but also when you get back, you have to perform in school wise. So it, to be honest, this has been the biggest challenge combining this, uh, these two things. So, um, but as I said, it's so worth it. Now I, f I feel so good now. <laughs> also good to hear, I mean, all the players have been extremely supportive towards you about it. We've seen all their congrats messages. But yeah. as well as that, I mean, they have so much fun celebrating it. I mean, you all sing together, but it's nice to celebrate these <laughs> moments too. <laughs> no, definitely. And they've been so good to everyone. Like, they've been really supportive. And if I need any help, like, I've got a dog too. So, like, to get everything go around, it's hard. So um, they've been really good to support. Looking after the dog as well? Well, sometimes, yeah, I need some... <laughs> so, sometimes I've needed help um, and they've been good. We should have brought the dog here for this. I know, I should. Sure. He's with me everywhere, so... We would have had a great, a great walk about this. Well, he is definitely happy that I'm done, because he <laughs> hates it. When I start doing the school stuff, he just, you can see it on him, he, he doesn't like it. Oh. So, I think he's probably more that happy than me. Maybe, yeah, but we are so thrilled and yeah. happy for you, so Thank congratulations. You. And thanks for chatting to me. Yeah, no problem. Thank you. <laughs> Yes, it's great to see what Maria is doing there now. Siobhan, how important is it to do something outside of football that's other than football? Really important. I think it's it's important to be able to kind of take your attention away so that when you're in football, your focus is fully there, but you can enable yourself to relax, whether that's I know some of the girls, whether they like going shopping, whether they like going out for coffee. Coffee seems to be the, the number one thing at the moment. But I think it's really important to try and do something that's going to help you, potentially when you stop your career. I think when I first started playing, you had to have a a job alongside playing because it wasn't fully professional so there was that kind of need to do it anyway and you had to work and you had to have other things going on but now for the players they kind of go straight into their professional careers so it's easy to forget about everything else but you never know when your career is going to be finished and as I know <laughs> it's not a long career you retire quite early um, so you need to have something to go into afterwards so for, for Maria to, to be th thinking about that is really important and hopefully some of the other players are as well and 
I've obviously got my, my two little ones now, the smallest one over there. <laughs> Hopefully keeping quite quiet. We don't want babies crying on the on the, on the the show, do we? I mean, we are enjoying having this little assistant with us today. <laughs> we though. are. She's a great camera assistant. <laughs> but yeah, I've, I've, done, I've just finished my master's as well. So it's, it's important to make sure you, you're keeping yourself going and keeping yourself mentally stimulated as well. Not that football doesn't take its toll as well. <laughs> Yeah, well, it's great to hear about it and congrats on your Masters as well. Plenty of them going round here. But now October has been Black History Month and we've been speaking to Nikita Paris. We need people to stand up and, you know, call out people if they're in the wrong, but also praise people when, you know, they've stepped up and been that educator because it's not easy on both sides, you know. But in order to create change, you've got to have people who are open and willing to, you know, come outside the comfort zone and, and learn. And then you spoke about these role models that you have, but you are a role model yourself now to these young people and what an achievement that is. Do you look back and think it's amazing to see you in this position now that you can affect and embrace the change? Yeah, definitely. And I think for me, each day is also a learning curve. You know, you do forget that you are a role model at times and your behaviours and how you conduct yourself does have an impact on someone who's looking up to you or, you know, just a young kid passing by. You just don't realise in every sense. And, it is hard to always stay on point, you know, you try to be the best human being you can be, but ultimately you're going to have ups and downs and you're going to make mistakes, I've made plenty of them. But I've always been open to, you know, reflect and be honest with, with my behaviours and how I've conducted myself and, you know, I'm always willing to learn. Yes, it's so important, isn't it, Siobhan, that, you know, all these players realise that they're role models and speak out about it, as well as what Nikita Paris has done. Yeah, definitely, and Nikita's a really good person for that she's confident in what she says she, she knows what she believes in she, she's got great values she's a brilliant person as well as a brilliant player I've, I've been fortunate enough to play with her at England for, for a long time and it's great to see her at Manchester United and speaking about important things that that need to be need to be recognized in society yes and now we're going to speak about Hayley Ladd who we'll hear from very shortly now what have you made of her performances over the past month you know a lot of the fans love her she's always quite a quiet calm character though isn't she she is she, she's a great character I think she's brilliant when she's on the pitch she's brilliant off the pitch she's one of those people that kind of just gets on with her job doesn't make too much of a fuss about anything and yeah, the performances. It doesn't surprise me. I think some people are like, oh, Hayley Ladd's been playing brilliantly. Hayley Ladd always plays brilliantly. <laughs> she just kind of, kind of goes under the radar a little bit. Consistent. So, yeah, consistent, but brilliantly consistent for club and for country. And the performances she's been putting in have been great. And it's nice to see her get a cheeky little goal as well. It is. So let's get the lowdown on Ladd. Hayley, first of all, it's great to speak to you. You can see the big smile on your face. Does that reflect how it's been these past couple of weeks? Uh, yeah, I think so. I think we're in a good stage of our season. I think we're progressing well as a team and uh, yeah, we're uh, coming off the back of some good league form. So, uh, no, all good at the moment. Well, speaking of that league form, it's five wins in your opening five matches, 14 goals scored, zero conceded and top of the table. It's a great way to start. Yeah, no, it is really pleasing. I think uh, we as a team try and take each game as it comes. Um, but, you know, there's no kind of shame in us reflecting and, and being proud of that progress over the last five games. I think this league is so competitive that every game is really tough, um, it's, you know, especially away games as well. There's um, all sorts of different things that you can face. So I think, yeah, we're really pleased with our progress so far, but um, yeah, we're not satisfied. We want to keep pushing and, and keep getting more. And just looking at the goals you have scored, it's 10 different goal scorers. How important is that? to have players all across the pitch providing goals such as yourself at the weekend. <laughs> yeah, no, it's um, no, it's brilliant that everyone's contributing to the um, to the goals. I think it shows our strength across the whole squad and uh, shows that everyone's got a different part to play. Um, and that's really key to us being really strong as a team. And you mentioned that it's a tough league and we've seen some surprising results early on in the season. Some teams beating some of the teams maybe didn't expect, but as a Manchester United player, do you look at these results or is it all about focusing on the next game for you, getting the three points and just continuing in that vein? Yeah, to be honest, I think for myself, I feel like last year I caught myself looking at the table and where, you know, I usually I'm quite disciplined with kind of trying to stay focused. So I think this year I am really trying to, on a personal note, just try and concentrate on the next game and therefore maybe enjoy each game a little bit more as well. If we just shift focus onto the Conti Cup, something you've been captain in the games. They've been a tough couple of games so far, but there's still two games to go. Yeah, no, I think um, we've obviously changed and maybe altered things slightly. And um, yeah, unfortunately haven't had the results that we wanted, but I think... We've kind of looked at it as those Conti Cup games were tests and 
if we keep our league form good, then hopefully we won't need any tests in, in the league, you know, to, to really learn from. I think those those games did maybe give us a little bit of a, I don't know, an awakening to, you know, what threats teams can pose against us. So, um, no, we want to keep kind of eyeing up the Conti Cup as a really key cup that we want to uh, dominate in. Um, and hopefully we can still do that within the group. Um, but yeah, we're happy with where we are. So as you can see, it's been a pretty decent month then, hasn't it? It most definitely has. Couldn't have gone, couldn't have gone better if they'd tried. <laughs> I mean, it has been great to see. And especially, you know, that confidence that they'll gain from this month, it's so important with the next few games. It is. And the, the games that they've played so far, the games that they've won, yes, they've been brilliant performances. I don't want to take anything away from that. But they're games that on paper, you'd look at them and you'd say, yes, these are games that we should be winning. They've put in good performances, got clean sheets, got lots of goals. But it's the games coming up now, the Chelsea, the Arsenal, the Manchester City. The ones the fans are excited for. The ones the fans are excited for. I'm excited for them as well, and I'm sure the players are. But they're the ones that are going to determine the su how successful the season is going to be. And that starts this weekend, doesn't it? It does, and I'm very looking forward to it now. And thank you so much for joining me today. No but worries. But now that is it for the Women's Football Show. But good luck to the women's team for their upcoming fixtures this month. And we'll see you next time.